b. The scriptural idea of sin. In giving the scriptural idea of sin it is necessary to call attention to several particulars. 1. Sin is a specific kind of evil. At the present time we hear a great deal about evil, and comparatively little about sin, and this is rather misleading. Not all evil is sin. Sin should not be confused with physical evil, with that which is injurious or calamitous. It is possible to speak not only of sin, but also of sickness as an evil, but then the word, evil, is used in two totally different senses. Above the physical lies the ethical sphere, in which the contrast between moral good and evil applies, and it is only in this sphere that we can speak of sin. And even in this sphere it is not desirable to substitute the word, evil, for, sin, without any further qualification, for the latter is more specific than the former. Sin is a moral evil. Most of the names that are used in scripture to designate sin point to its moral character. Chatterty H. directs attention to it as an action that misses the mark and consists in a deviation from the right way. Avil and Avon indicate that it is a want of integrity and rectitude, a departure from the appointed path. Pesha refers to it as a revolt or a refusal of subjection to rightful authority, a positive transgression of the law, and a breaking of the covenant. And Risha points to it as a wicked and guilty departure from the law. Furthermore, it is designated as guilt by Asham, as unfaithfulness and treason, by Maral, as vanity, by Avon, and as perversion or distortion of nature, crookedness, by Ava. The corresponding New Testament words, such as Hamartia, Adikia, Parabasis, Paraptoma, Anomia, Paranomia, and others, point to the same ideas. In view of the use of these words, and of the way in which the Bible usually speaks of sin, there can be no doubt about its ethical character. It is not a calamity that came upon man unawares, poisoned his life, and ruined his happiness, but an evil course which man has deliberately chosen to follow and which carries untold misery with it. Fundamentally, it is not. Something passive, such as a weakness, a fault, or an imperfection, for which we cannot be held responsible, but an active opposition to God, and a positive transgression of his law, which constitutes guilt. Sin is the result of a free but evil choice of man. This is the plain teaching of the Word of God, Genesis 3 verses 1 to 6, Isaiah 48 verse 8, Romans 1 verses 18 to 32, 1 John 3 verse 4. The application of the philosophy of evolution to the study of the Old Testament led some scholars to the conviction that the ethical idea of sin was not developed until the time of the prophets, but this view is not borne out by the way in which the earliest books of the Bible speak of sin. 2. Sin has an absolute character. In the ethical sphere the contrast between good and evil is absolute. There is no neutral condition between the two. While there are undoubtedly degrees in both, there are no gradations between the good and the evil. The transition from the one to the other is not of a quantitative, but of a qualitative character. A moral being that is good does not become evil by simply diminishing his goodness, but only by a radical qualitative change, by turning to sin. Sin is not a lesser degree of goodness, but a positive evil. This is plainly taught in the Bible. He who does not love God is thereby characterized as evil. Scripture knows of no position of neutrality. It urges the wicked to turn to righteousness, and sometimes speaks of the righteous as falling into evil, but it does not contain a single indication that either the one or the other ever lands in a neutral. Position. Man is either on the right side or on the wrong side, Matt. 10 32 33, 12 30, Luke 11 verse 23, James 2 verse 10. 3. Sin always has relation to God and his will. The older dogmaticians realized that it was impossible to have a correct conception of sin, without contemplating it in relation to God and his will, and therefore emphasized this aspect and usually spoke of sin as, lack of conformity to the law of God. This is undoubtedly a correct formal definition of sin. But the question arises, just what is the material content of the law? What does it demand? If this question is answered, it will be possible to determine what sin is in a material sense. Now there is no doubt about it that the great central demand of the law is love to God. And if from the material point of view moral goodness consists in love to God, then moral evil must consist in the opposite. It is separation from God, opposition to God, hatred of God.
and this manifests itself in constant transgression of the law of God in thought, word, and deed. The following passages clearly show that Scripture contemplates sin in relation to God and His law, either as written on the tablets of the heart, or as given by Moses, Romans 1 verse 32, 2 12-14, for 15, James 2 verse 9, 1 John 3 verse 4. 4. Sin includes both guilt and pollution. Guilt is the state of deserving condemnation or of being liable to punishment for the violation of a law or a moral requirement. It expresses the relation which sin bears to justice or to the penalty of the law. But even so the word has a twofold meaning. It may denote an inherent quality of the sinner, namely, his demerit, ill desert, or guiltiness, which renders him worthy of punishment. Dabney speaks of this as, potential guilt. It is inseparable from sin, is never found in one who is not personally a sinner, and is permanent, so that once established, it cannot be removed by pardon. But it may also denote the obligation to satisfy justice, to pay the penalty of sin, actual guilt, as Dabney calls it. Christ our penal substitute, pp 10 f. It is not inherent in man, but is the penal enactment of the lawgiver, who fixes the penalty of the guilt. It may be removed by the satisfaction of the just demands of the law personally or vicariously. While many deny that sin includes guilt, this does not comport with the fact that sin was threatened and is indeed visited with punishment, and clearly contradicts the plain statements of Scripture, Matt 6 12, Romans 3 verse 19, 5 verse 18, Ephesians 2 verse 3. By pollution we understand the inherent corruption to which every sinner is subject. This is a reality in the life of every individual. It is not conceivable without guilt, though guilt as included in a penal relationship, is conceivable without immediate pollution. Yet it is always followed by pollution. Everyone who is guilty in Adam is, as a result, also born with a corrupt nature. The pollution of sin is clearly taught in such passages as Job 14 verse 4, Jeremiah 17 verse 9, Matt. 7 colon 15 20, Rom. 8 colon 5 8, Ephesians 4 verses 17 to 19. 5. Sin has its seat in the heart. Sin does not reside in any one faculty of the soul, but in the heart, which in scriptural psychology is the central organ of the soul, out of which are the issues of life. And from this center its influence and operations spread to the intellect, the will, the affections, in short, to the entire man, including his body. In his sinful state the whole man is the object of God's displeasure. There is a sense in which it can be said that sin originated in the will of man, but then the will does not designate some actual volition as much as it does the volitional nature of man. There was a tendency of the heart underlying the actual volition when sin entered the world. This view is in perfect harmony with the representations of Scripture in such passages as the following, Proverbs 4 verse 23. Jeremiah 17 verse 9, Matt 15 colon 19, 20, Luke 6 45, Hebrews 3 verse 12. 6. Sin does not consist exclusively in overt acts. Sin does not consist only in overt acts, but also in sinful habits and in a sinful condition of the soul. These three are related to one another as follows, the sinful state is the basis of the sinful habits, and these manifest themselves in sinful deeds. There is also truth, however, in the contention that repeated sinful deeds lead to the establishment of sinful habits. The sinful acts and dispositions of man must be referred to and find their explanation in a corrupt nature. The passages referred to in the preceding paragraph substantiate this view, for they clearly prove that the state or condition of man is thoroughly sinful. And if the question should still be raised, whether the thoughts and affections of the natural man, called flesh in scripture, should be regarded as constituting sin, it might be answered by pointing to such passages as the following, Matt 5 colon 22, 28, Romans 7 verse 7, Galatians 5 verses 17 and 24, and others. In conclusion it may be said that sin may be defined as lack of conformity to the moral law of God, either in act, disposition, or state.